Hi folks, welcome back to the second in our two-part series on working inside of your ISR 4331, upgrading the hardware, really cranking in under the hood. In the first video, if you haven't watched that, I encourage you to watch that first. That's where we go through upgrading your power supply, adding in a PVDM4 voice DSP module, uh, and also adding in an MSATA SSD storage module inside of the ISR. We also cover breaking into, opening up, and working inside of your ISR. Uh, so that's a very good primer, a very good first video to watch. Before we get into the second video, this one, which is where we're going to talk about DRAM and flash upgrades. Uh, now, upgrading the DRAM and flash is a little bit different in our ISR 4000s, uh, but what we're going to talk about here on the 4331 is going to be applicable to the rest of the ISR family. So you can watch this one video and apply it to your 4451. Flash is in a little different location there, but uh, all of the procedures, everything that we're going to be doing here is going to be completely the same. Now, I said upgrading DRAM and flash is a little bit different than what you're used to. It's why we're dedicating a whole video to it. Uh, and that's because we have a couple of rules that may not be obvious when working with uh, an ISR. The real major rule here uh, is that anytime you have a, a DRAM in the system, anytime you upgrade your DRAM, you have to make sure that the flash is at least two times the size of that DRAM. We enforce this rule when you order a new system, but in this case we're upgrading a system in the field, so we need to make sure that we stick to that rule. So we're going to be upgrading from a 4 gig system to a 16 gigabyte system uh, as far as the DRAM goes, so that means that we're going to need to upgrade our flash from 8 gigabytes to 32. Uh, and that's a rule that we enforce. The reason behind that is because with a 4 gig or an 8 gig or a 16 gig uh, memory system, we need to be able to make sure that we have enough flash to handle a core file, basically a core dump, of all of that memory in the event of a system crash. Uh, and that basically allows TAC, Cisco Technical Assistance Center, to help you out if you do have a software crash. Now, we don't have to copy the entire contents of memory. We actually do some compression and, and choose what we store. So we don't need a complete copy of that 4 gigs or 8 gigs of system memory. But we do need quite a bit. So that's why we only require twice the amount of DRAM because we want to make sure that we have enough room to at least have a couple of core files in there as well as enough room to make sure that we can keep your iOS XE operating system, maybe a couple of different versions of that as well as any log files or anything else that you need. So that's where the two times rule comes from for Flash. Now, if you forgot to order Flash, a Flash upgrade when you're doing this DRAM upgrade, don't worry, the system will work. Uh, it'll work perfectly fine. It's not going to crash just because it doesn't have enough flash, but it will give you an error message when it boots. It'll give you a log message saying that this is an unsupported configuration. You need to upgrade your flash, and you do, uh, because if you do have a crash for whatever reason, we need to be able to support that. And the only way we can do that is with one of those core files. Um, so the system will run. It will give you error messages, but make sure that as soon as you can, you also go back and upgrade that flash as part of the system. The other thing about the flash inside of the ISR 4000, it's a little bit different than previous ISRs and, and some other systems, uh, is that we actually store more than just the files that you can see there. We actually partition that flash to store some extra stuff. Now that extra stuff is, is some pretty obvious stuff that we're going to have inside of the router. That's where we store our startup configuration, our config files for the system. They're stored on a partition in your boot flash and your flash inside of the system. That's also where we store our permanent license keys. So if you order a system from Cisco with, say, a SEC, HSEC, app, UC license as part of the system, or even a performance license, those are going to be installed and stored by manufacturing on that flash device. So when you pull out that flash, those licenses go with it. They're tied to the serial number of the device, so they're not useful to anyone else. Uh, but you need to add those licenses back in. Now, luckily, we're able to export off all of those licenses and uh, all of those config files off to a USB device. Um, so the things that you'll need for this installation, of course, your DRAM upgrade and your flash upgrade, but you also need a place to store those files temporarily while we're upgrading that flash. Standard USB thumb drive works perfectly fine. We do have supported, officially supported, Cisco USB thumb drives that you can order and, and use for this. Um, honestly, we're not doing anything operational here. We're just backing up files and then copying them back to the system. So no harm whatsoever in using just a standard off-the-shelf USB drive. This happens to be a 32-gig uh, Lexar drive. Just about anything will work uh, because unlike previous versions of iOS and the ISR G2s, iOS XE 
on the ISR 4000s is a Linux operating system. And what that brings with us is a huge amount of file system support. Uh, so Linux has natural support for FAT32, which is the normal uh, file, file system format on uh, a USB flash drive. Uh, and so we support larger flash devices, just about anything on the, uh, on the market uh, will work uh, for these. Even some external hard drives, although those are a little bit hit and miss depending on you know, how much power they require. So I stick with just a standard off the shelf USB thumb drive. Honestly, for what we're doing here, uh, a one gig uh, free flash drive from a trade show is perfectly fine. This just happens to be one that I had uh, in my backpack. So in addition to that, because we're actually copying files off to flash and then backing them and then copying them back to the system, you're going to need a terminal of some sort. I'm using a laptop here. Um, of course, you could use a standard PC. You could use an iPad, an Android tablet, um, you know, any type of tablet that has uh, the ability to, to get some kind of a terminal access to the router. You can SSH Telnet into the system. But since we have to be here physically anyway to upgrade the DRAM and the flash, uh, I'm going to be using a Cisco USB console cable. This is the nice official Cisco Blue console cable. But to be honest with you, any USB Type A to USB mini, not micro, mini USB port will work. Uh, USB cable will work. So if you don't have one, you can go down to just about any store, pick one up, and it'll work just fine. Uh, drivers for this uh, are going to be not really required. The standard operating system drivers are going to work for Linux, uh, Mac OS, modern versions of Windows. I'm running Windows 10 here. No driver required. Uh, earlier versions of Windows 7 uh, did require a driver that's available on the, uh, the Cisco website. Windows XP, of course, same thing. Uh, it'll require some standard drivers, um, and, uh, and that'll get you going. Then standard, after that, the standard 9600 8-in-1 console settings work just fine. It is the same console driver, the same USB console port used across Cisco and a variety of platforms. Most of our products now have both an RJ45 and a USB console. It's just easier for me personally to use a USB console, so it's a lot easier to deal with. Now, that's what we're going to use to copy the files off of Flash and then to copy them back onto Flash after we do the hardware upgrade. Uh, but to actually do that hardware upgrade, we're going to need the same tools that we used in the last video. So a couple of screwdrivers. Actually, we don't need the small screwdriver. We just need the big screwdriver to, uh, to get into the system. Um, and uh, the ESD strap. So we'll need the ESD strap since we are working uh, inside of the router itself and we don't want to fry things here. Okay, so that's it. Let's uh, get into the console here, start copying off files, and uh, then we can get cranking into the, uh, into the upgrade. So we've got ourselves set up here. Uh, I have my USB flash device inside of the, uh, the USB port on our 4331. Now the 4331 does have the USB, the console ports on the bezel side of the system. Other ISRs have the uh, console and IO port and the and, uh, USB port on the IO side. 4331 is just really dense over here on the IO side, so we had to move those uh, connections over to the, to the bezel side. That's the only reason there. Uh, I also have my USB console port hooked up here, my, my USB console cable. It's on COM3 on my laptop, and we've already got a, uh, a console here uh, to the system. Now, I want to take this opportunity to point out that on Cisco.com, we have a handy document, a handy guide here, uh, called Upgrading Flash Memory for Cisco 4000 Series ISRs, and that happens to be exactly what we're doing here. Uh, so I'm walking through the steps that we'll be taking to, uh, to upgrade our, our flash, the, the steps to copy all of our necessary files off of the internal flash to our USB flash, doing the, uh, the physical upgrade, which isn't really covered in this document, and then copying those files back onto the system here. So uh, if you'd like, you can just go ahead and follow along in this document. Go ahead and pause, I won't mind. Uh, or you can just go ahead and stop the video. Don't tell me, my feelings will be heard if you do. But stop the video and just, and just go ahead and follow the document. So this document, which I have the link on the screen right now, as well as in the show notes, um, that will walk you through everything that we're doing here today, except for the physical installation uh, of the memory and the, and the flash. Okay, so if you, if you want to do that, that's fine, but we're not going to do that. We're going to dive right in and uh, go ahead and, and take a look at this system. So uh, let's take a look at our USB flash. This happens to be in USB slot zero on this system. Uh, do a DIR, we can see that there are no files in here. Uh, this should, this flash device should work perfectly fine in an ISR if it was formatted in Windows or Linux or, or Mac OS, FAT32 file system usually works. But just to be safe, I like to go ahead, especially since we don't have anything on here, uh, go ahead and give it a format inside of the router. Doesn't hurt just to make sure that it's uh, completely hunky-dory and nice and happy uh, with the router uh, and, and everything's all good and clean. Uh, give it another look here and we've got a nice clear 
uh, flash. Now, let's take a look at our boot flash. That's our internal flash on iOS XE systems. Uh, you can see here we've got uh, several different directories and uh, and files here that look like a Linux file system. Uh, lost and found, core, of course, that's where core files would be found. Uh, timers, trace logs, installers. Nothing here that we really care about uh, taking off because iOS XE is automatically going to generate these directories and this, this file system. The only thing we do care about is that last file there. Uh, this is our actual iOS XE operating system file. Now, when we pull this flash device out of the system, we need an operating system file, so we're going to copy this guy uh, over to our USB flash. So normal copy commands work, including tab to complete. So I'm going to copy this guy over to USB 0. That'll take just a few seconds here, because if you look at the file size here, uh, this is a roughly a little bit over 408 megabyte file. Uh, if you're familiar with ISRG2s and other classic iOS systems, you were used to dealing with 50 to 60 megabyte file systems or, or files for the, uh, for the router. Uh, iOS XE is a different beast. It's a, it's a Linux operating system, so uh, we have a, a full you know, Linux operating system plus the, uh, the code that runs in the, uh, the data plane processors here. So we're looking at 400, 408, in this case, uh, megabyte files. That's another reason why we need uh, DRAM in the ranges of 4 to 16 gigs, and we also need flash in the, uh, the ranges of, uh, of 8 to 32 gigs. Uh, because we're dealing with much, much larger file sizes now uh, in, uh, in the iOS XE operating system. So that's copied over. Always good to verify it here uh, if you're paranoid like I am. Uh, the other two major things that we're going to need uh, to copy off of that internal flash are going to be our configurations, our startup configurations, which you can't see, uh, by the way, if I do a DIR uh, boot flash again. You know, there's no configuration here. There's no uh, running config file. Uh, it's actually there on the flash. It's just hid, It's just stored in a uh, in a hidden partition uh, on the flash. So uh, trust me, it's there. As is the other thing that we need to copy off our permanent license keys. Uh, so we need to copy both of those off. Uh, and then finally, if you have anything else on your flash on your boot flash that you want to have available uh, after we do the upgrade, make sure that you copy that off now. Uh, because once you pull this flash device out of the system, uh, you're not going to be able to get any files off of it. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, copy off our configuration. Of course, our startup configuration is critically important. Uh, we want to make sure that we get that. So we're going to copy that over to USB 0 here. Now, you might have a different running configuration. If you haven't saved it or maybe you don't want to, you can, of course, save that off separately. Uh, if you want. Maybe you have some other backed up configurations on uh, on your internal flash. Make sure that you get those uh, because, as I said, they won't be available uh, after the fact. Now, uh, as far as copying off the licenses, there's a really handy command here called license. Uh, and if you are curious about what else you can do with licenses, you can do lots of other things with licenses. You can install licenses, modify, purge, um, do lots of things with smart licenses. Um, in this case, we're just going to do the plain and simple save. We're going to save them to USB 0, and we need a license, uh, a name for these licenses to go through. We're just going to call these license backup.lic for license. Um, the file name is completely arbitrary, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's completely up to you. Uh, and there we go. So all of the permanent licenses we have on our system are saved uh, to, this, to this file here. Uh, now, depending on how you ordered the system, you may or may not have very many licenses uh, on the system. In this case, we ordered the system from this router from Cisco Manufacturing uh, with a full suite of licenses installed. So if you do a show license, you can see here uh, I have a, a lifetime app license, I have a lifetime UC, uh, security, uh, IP base, don't really need an IP base, uh, we don't actually check for that. I also have a lifetime IPsec and throughput license here. So that's a full suite of licenses. Uh, I can generate them uh, after the fact. I can get them generated from Cisco after the fact. Uh, and I can use just right to use licenses. Um, but it's so much easier to just spend a couple of seconds here backing up the license and then uh, reinstalling them uh, on, the, uh, on the new system. So that's pretty much it. If we take a look at our USB flash one more time here, you can see that uh, we've got our operating system file that we're going to need to boot the system. Uh, because keep in mind, our new flash is not going to have an operating system on it. It's going to be completely blank. So we're going to need to boot from this USB device. It's nice to have an operating system there for that. Uh, we have our startup configuration. We have our running configuration, which not really any difference here. But it's there if we need it. Uh, and we also have our licenses backup. So that's pretty much it. Uh, it's time to cut the power off and uh, dig in and actually do the, uh, the hardware upgrade now.
All right, so physically upgrading the uh, the DRAM and the flash inside of our 4331 is really straightforward. Uh, if you watched the first video, upgrading the PVDM and the uh, uh, the MSATA drive is uh, is basically all of the skills that you're going to need to do this. You do need a uh, regular number two Phillips head screwdriver to remove the K screws. I've already done that, and of course I'm using my handy dandy magnetic US ma magnetic dish to store the screws so I don't lose them. Uh, the other thing that we're going to need is a smaller screwdriver. I actually said earlier you don't need this. I, turns out I was wrong. You are going to need this uh, to, uh, to remove the screw for the, uh, for the flash. Uh, and of course we're going to need our ESD strap. I'm going to go ahead and put that on uh, just because uh, I don't trust myself to not destroy this router when I open the, open the, uh, the lid. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull this off. Now if you are powering down a running system as we just were, make sure you wait at least five minutes or so uh, for the power supply capacitors to discharge. Um, they actually do store quite a bit of latent voltage, uh, of latent energy inside of them, so uh, um, even though they're behind this protective shield here, you're probably okay. You do not want a stray uh, screwdriver accidentally poking in there um, if you can help it. Okay, the other things we need, before I forget, uh, is our actual upgrades. So uh, to do this upgrade, we're upgrading from a 4 gigabyte system to a 16 gigabyte system and we're also upgrading the flash at the same time. So flash, as you can see here, uh, is actually labeled on the board. Uh, you probably can't see it in the video too well, uh, but he's actually here. He's actually labeled so you can actually find it real nice and easy. Uh, just a, a simple replacement device from Cisco. Now, to do the DRAM upgrade, you're actually going to order two 8 gigabyte sticks from Cisco. We actually sell the, uh, uh, the memory as two different spare devices. So uh, you need uh, two 8 gig sticks and you're actually going to ship in two different components here uh, and that will replace the two uh, two gig sticks that we have here uh, by default. Let's go ahead and do the memory upgrade because that's just as straightforward as upgrading a memory in your PC. You just uh, pop it out nice and simple and uh, actually the longest part of this procedure is actually opening these ESD bags. Um, so it's just nice and straightforward. Of course, it's keyed just like any other DIMM you'd be putting in and uh, can only go in one way. Of course, these are both 8 gig sticks, so uh, it doesn't matter which one you put in. You do need to have both DIMM slots occupied, though, because we do actually write to both of them. We get faster access to memory by having uh, two sticks in there. The system will not work with just a single DIMM. Uh, as far as upgrading the flash, we've just got a single screw here uh, that you basically just un remove and be very careful with this screw. Uh, if you lose it and it goes under the motherboard, which it can do because you're right at the edge there, um, you will not be happy. That's a very tiny screw. It's very easy to drop. Uh, I have done it before and the flash just pulls right out. Just a single little uh, connector here. Um, pretty straightforward, easy to pull out. Replacement flash is the exact opposite. You just basically uh, take the new guy, drop him in, line up the, uh, the connector there. And again, there's only one way you can do this. It's really hard to make a mistake. Honestly, the biggest problem you can have here is dropping this screw. Uh, because you drop this screw, it can go all over the place in here. And you do have to have this screw. Uh, if you don't have it, you're just gonna, you're, you're never gonna know if that flash is gonna vibrate out, if it's gonna get shaken out at some point in the future. Um, you need the screw, basically. Uh, and don't lose it because the flash upgrade, the new flash upgrade does not come with a replacement screw. Uh, that's something you have to have. So that's pretty much it. We are done uh, with the, uh, the DRAM and the flash upgrade. Uh, only next step is to uh, put the, the hood back on this thing. So lever that in push it down, put in all the screws, the four across the front, uh, the one on the left, the one on the right. I'm going to spare you guys uh, that turmoil of watching me do that. Uh, then next step, final step, is really to, uh, to power this guy up and uh, let him boot into Raman and we'll go through uh, copying everything off of our USB key there, our USB stick, uh, over to the uh, new internal boot flash. We're back now with our ISR fully buttoned up, lid on, all the screws in. Uh, powered back up with our USB drive in, our console cable connected to our terminal. Uh, and we've had a few minutes here for the system to boot. If you were watching the terminal while the system was booting, the console of the router, uh, you'll see that it's gone through a couple of auto boot sequences trying to find 
its uh, boot image, its uh, iOS XE image to boot from. Of course, this is a blank, brand new version of Flash, so there's nothing there. It's going to give up eventually and settle down into uh, ROM monitor mode here. So uh, we're in ROM on, nothing to be afraid of here. We can still use uh, a lot of the same commands that we're familiar with in iOS XE. Certainly DIR works just fine. We can see the contents of our USB device and that first file there, uh, lucky that we saved it off because that's now going to be our boot file, uh, our boot image. We just do a simple USB boot or B for USB. Uh, and then unfortunately tab to complete doesn't work in Raman. It's not quite that fancy. Uh, so we just have to do a copy and paste. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, we go through copying that 400 plus megabyte file and actually booting it into the system. I'm going to go ahead and speed things up for you because uh, you don't really want to sit here and watch uh, the system boot for, uh, for a few minutes. Now you can see that we failed to initialize NVRAM there, meaning that, uh, hey, we've got a problem with NVRAM, it's blank and the system wasn't expecting that when it booted. Uh, but we're going through and actually fixing things up now. The system's finishing up its boot and, uh, and actually taking care of that. We're at the auto install prompt. I'm going to do a control C to get past that because um, we don't need to have the system uh, do its uh, auto configuration. And uh, to be honest with you, I've, I've never seen anyone use these. Um, so they really aren't too useful. Um, we actually have our actual startup configuration already saved onto our USB device, so we're perfectly good with that. Finishing up the boot, I'll let this finish um, just so we have a nice clean console here. All right, so enable. We're back here, and uh, if I take a look at our boot flash, uh, you can see that it's not blank. Um, we've actually gone ahead and started uh, setting it up. With the, uh, with the necessary um, files and directories for iOS XE. Uh, it's already taken care of by the system, so we have a core directory now. We have our trace logs, all of the automatically generated stuff that's here, but we don't have uh, an actual systems image. Uh, so let's take a look there from what we have on USB 0. Uh, the first thing we'll do is copy this guy over. So let's copy USB 0. In this case, we can tab to complete, so I'll just do ISR tab and copy that over to boot flash. That takes just a few seconds here. We do not have USB 3.0 ports on the ISRs. That's something that um, if they had been available when we actually did the design the layout for the ISRs, we would have probably added them. They just uh, really was just kind of emerging right about the same time we were doing the, uh, the development for the ISR 4000. So these are just USB 2.0 ports, um, but still not too painful doing a 400 meg copy in, in just, a few, just a few seconds. So, DR boot flash, you can see our image there. Uh, we could have multiple images and, uh, and use a boot statement to select which one we want. In this case, we just have one, so no need to do that. Let's go ahead and copy our config file back over. So let's copy USB 0 startup config to our just simple startup config. All right, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and uh, Copy startup to running, uh, just so we don't really have to, uh, to handle too, too many things. Some things will actually be picked up from the, uh, the running config when we do that. Uh, last but not least, let's get our uh, license files copied over. If I do a show license first, you can see that uh, we, we really don't have any permanent licenses installed. We do have eval right to use licenses, which are uh, uh, installed in all systems uh, by default, so we can basically enable these licenses with a configuration command, uh, reboot the system, then you'll get 60 days of an evaluation period. Uh, after that 60 days, these automatically convert to a right to use license, which means that uh, you're technically out of the license. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's in violation unless you've purchased a right to use license. And that's something that we don't check on the router itself. We're never gonna turn that capability off, uh, but we basically expect after the eval period that you've actually paid for that RTU license. But we have permanent licenses, so there's no re reason to do that. Uh, we just need to uh, do a license install 
and in this case they're on USB 0 and I called it licensebackup.lic. Okay, this is just a standard XML file, by the way. If you guys, if you want to insert this in your in your desktop, you can take a look at that, and you can see what the uh, the XML licenses actually look like. Uh, of course, these are digitally signed to the um, to the system itself, so they're not going to be useful on any other system unless you happen to have the same serial number uh, as this router right here. And and who knows, maybe you'll wind up on eBay one day, and uh, these licenses will make sense. But uh, here we go. License is installed. It looks like everything was successful. You can actually see here that. Uh, five of five licenses were successfully installed. That's a good message. Uh, none of them failed to install. Of course, none of them were existing. And I can do a show license here. And we can see that we now have permanent. Uh, however, these are not active. These are active, but they are not in use. Um, that's because uh, all of these licenses need a reboot to be active. If I do a show version, at the very end of a show version, you can actually see uh, something that's really handy. The uh, technology package information, of course, current, we have IP base. That's there by default. Uh, we don't have AppX, UC, or security, but on the next reboot, we do have AppX, UC, and security. So next reboot, all of this will be taken care of. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to go ahead and do a reload here. I'm not going to save the configuration because I've got that copied over to startup. And uh, when my system comes back up, it'll be good to go with the full configuration, the uh, right version of system software and all of the licenses enabled uh, permanently. Okay, so that's it. We've got a new system upgraded. We are actually uh, now up to a, uh, a full uh, 16 gigabyte system. You can actually see there it is, 16 gigs of physical memory here uh, and, uh, uh, and twice that in terms of uh, boot flash. Okay, so thanks a lot. That really covers it for this. Uh, stay tuned to the, uh, US, to the uh, YouTube channel. We're going to have more uh, exciting videos in the realm of Cisco routing uh, technical content. If you have any suggestions for content, anything you'd like to see, uh, post that in the comments here and uh, we'll get some TMEs from the, uh, from the business unit working on that. Thanks a lot and have a great day.